What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another hate scratching episode of Insane Disappearances, where we talk about the mysterious and the unknown and the unexplained when it comes to people who disappear in national parks, national forests, urban areas, and rural areas. Tonight's episode, I'm probably going to get in two stories. They're pretty, I won't say vague, but they're very short in information because of the way they disappeared. Uh, there's not much information on them because the, the ones that have the less information are the ones where people just vanish without a trace, leaving no evidence of how they disappeared or most of the time where they disappeared. They know where they were going, but they don't know how they disappeared or where they disappeared at. Um, so I'm trying to get in two uh, stories. One of them is actually about a uh, man that I heard about on um, Coast to Coast AM. His name is William Carl Myers. Um, his mom called into the show one night and got a chance to talk to David Politis about her son. He actually never heard of the story, but it was a pretty crazy one. Um, now, the way the story went was he was supposed to have been going to um, Point Reyes uh, Seashore uh, for a little surfing. It's a Point Reyes Seashore National Park. And um, apparently he actually stopped off to see a friend without um, informing him that he was coming. And um, he stayed there for a couple of days and I think he picked up some uh, supplies that he needed. I think he left his, surf his surfboard there and he came to get it. Um, but you know, like I said, the, the information is very vague. But yeah, he picked up a surfboard that he had left you know, with this guy. And it was this actually a forum on a website called uh, websleuths.com and he um, was basically commenting on what happened uh, like I think a day before he actually disappeared and I think this guy's name is um, Bill uh, something um, let me see his name is Bill May yeah Bill May and what he was saying like I said before um, and this was like the day before he disappeared he came to his house in San Geronimo yeah San Geronimo Geronimo, California, to pick up his surfboard that he left with him, you know, about a month uh, or so ago. Uh, you now he had visited a few times before, you know, you know, for food and a place to sleep. I guess why he was on the road or whatever. Um, and he did say he was acting kind of strange, you know, and he had to tell him that he couldn't just show up unannounced, you know, like that, you know, without calling. Um, so, uh, basically at that point he left and he was on his way to Point Reyes, you know, for a little, um, surfing in a place called Paolo Mar uh, Marin or Marin. It was a, uh, Paolo, it was a, uh, um, Paolo, Paolo, excuse me, Paolo Marin Trailhead. And this was, like I said, in Point Reyes Bird Observatory area. Um, and that's what he was indicated that he was missing. Um, now, the mother who called into the show was saying that um, his um, all his belongings were still in his van. And it was parked in uh, the parking lot of the area where he was going to. And he also said that uh, he found out that, uh, I think when he found out where he was, that he was being obtained by National Park Police for marijuana. Um, uh, I guess he had he was in possession of marijuana, and right after that, that's when he was never seen again. So, did they have anything to do with his disappearance? I don't know because he thinks it has something to do with foul play. But um, there is no proof of that. They just know that he went in and never came out. Um, so like I said, they found all his belongings still in his van, um, and he was seen handcuffed by you know the National Park Service people. Uh, they called him the GGNRA, which is um, 
What did he call that? Yeah, I think they did say what that, you know, what they actually called that. But the main thing is, his mom, his mom, uh, when she called into the show, she's actually um, residing in Hawaii. So um, they say he may have some Hawaiian descent in his blood. But she didn't look Hawaiian. I think she just moved there because um, she looked more Caucasian than anything. And so did her son, which you'll see on my thumbnail when I finish, you know, making the video. Um, but that was pretty much it. You know, there has been no trace of him. He just vanished without a trace. And he's never been found. And this happened back in 2003. Um, I think it was June 9th of 2003. Yeah. In June 9th of 2003, that's when he disappeared. Um, but yeah, the, uh, the information is very sketchy and very vague. So all she could really tell him was that how he um, disappeared um, at Point Reyes. He was supposed to be going surfing, and they found all of his belongings, including the wetsuit that he had in his still in his van, along with all his, the rest of his belongings. And uh, she tried contacting the park service, of course, and that whole situation has been real spotty, as well as the other uh, cases dealing with people who disappear in national parks. Um, she couldn't really get anything out of it. Uh, they were Pilates told her to try and get a copy of the report and send it to him. She said her internet service was kind of spotty, and I'm pretty sure if the government was involved or knew anything about the case, they probably kind of messed with it. Um, but who knows? Uh, there's no proof of that. But she said that she her internet was kind of spotty after she tried to do all that. Um, so I don't know if anything came of that. There's, there hasn't been anything said about it since um, that interview that she, uh, that she well, the, um, that, that time when she called into the show to talk to David Pilates. Um But other than that, that was pretty much it. You know, it was very sketchy. Um, but the fact is that he actually disappeared and there's never been any trace of him ever found. Um, they just know he was going to Point Reyes. And I don't even think he made it to this, the whole... I never. I don't think he made it uh, into the area to surf. He, he went in. They said that he was found handcuffed by raiders over uh, eh, excuse me over marijuana uh, possession. Um, and that was pretty much it. Um, let me see if I can find that part. It says right here. Um, okay, and and lo and behold, he he told he told me. That he was out at Paolo uh, Marin the day the day before Bill disappeared, and that he witnessed the GGNRA Park Rangers uh, were detaining Bill for what appeared to be marijuana possession charge. You know, so Chad said uh, Ch Chad had mentioned that Bill was sitting on the ground with his hands handcuffed behind his back while the officers were searching his van. Okay. So yeah, that was pretty much it on that. After that, that was it. They never, he's never been found. Um, so did they have something to do with him, with him disappearing? I don't know, but that's what was being said. So if anybody has any information about what happened with um, William Carl Myers, if you saw him that day, and you may have, if you may have seen what happened, I would suggest you call the law enforcement in um, Point Reyes uh, well not so much law enforcement in Point Reyes but there's really no information on who you can call other than his mother but there's no information there's no numbers or anything on here about who you can call oh, excuse me excuse me but anyway um, yeah that was pretty much it on that case now the next one is going to be about a young man. Um, his name was Edward Ashton Stubbs. Edward Ashton Stubbs. Um, now with him, he's been missing since June 17th of 2013 from Dickinson, North Dakota. <clears throat> now the classification of his disappearance is endangered missing. Uh, his date of birth was June 21st, 1997. His age. Uh, is at 15 at the time when he disappeared. Um, 
His weight and height is uh, 5'10 and 140 pounds. Distinguished characteristics of this young man is Caucasian male, light brown hair, brown eyes. Uh, Edward goes by the middle name Ashton or the, uh, the nickname Ash. Uh, he may use the name Ashton Lebron or uh, Ashton Lebron. Now, the clothing and jewelry that he was wearing, uh, oh, you see, he uh, had a blue jacket, a white t shirt, and blue jeans. The clothing is likely soiled with drywall mud. Um, now, the medical conditions of this young man is that Edward may be. And in need of medical attention for unspecified reasons. Um, now, here's the thing: with a lot of the cases of young men disappearing, the pe the ones that disappear are the ones that have like some sort of medical di medical condition, or or they could be disabled, or whatever the case may be. Um, it could be anything at that point. But they they always seem to have some sort of disorder or medical condition. And with him, it's unspecified. You know or what his condition could be, but um, I, I guess they were informed that he did may ha he he may have a medical condition. They just never mentioned what the condition was. Now, Edward is from El Paso, Texas, in the summer of 2013. Uh, he t he took a bus to North Dakota to work a, constru a construction job and stay with his cousins. Up Stay in his cousin's apartment in Fargo, uh, North Dakota. Uh, he was last seen on June 17th, five days before his 16th birthday, on Broadway Street in Dickinson, North, North Dakota. He was laying drywall when he walked away from the construction site after lunch and never returned. He didn't have access to a vehicle and any money at the time of his disappearance. There were a few report, reported sightings of Edward in, Bris, in Bismarck um, and Fargo after he, after he vanished, but none have been confirmed. Although many agencies classify his, uh, him as a runaway, his family doesn't believe he would have gone this long without contacting them. Uh, so not, at this point, his case still remains unsolved. Now, with that situation, is a very big upset because he's he's young and he seems like a very well-rounded young man because he he worked at a very um, uh, strenuous job in construction but it paid very well obviously um, and he obviously was um, um, he had a very good work ethic you know he was doing what he had to do to make money and he was obviously responsible, but for him to just walk away after lunch and then not come back, it's anybody's guess as to what could have happened to him. Um, he could have been abducted by someone as he walked away from the construction site, or it could have been a scenario where he just vanished off the face of the earth. Because for them not to have any evidence of what happened to him and for anyone not to see anything, uh, it is uh, pretty pretty strange, you know, pretty weird. Uh, in his case, uh, by it being unsolved, it could be a good chance that maybe they'll find something. But like I said, this happened in 2013. Are they still looking for him? I don't know. Um, will they ever find anything? I would hope so. But in all cases, when it comes to young people disappearing, um. It's more than likely that if if he was to be found, they may find his remains somewhere in an area that didn't make any sense. Uh, now, like I said, for him to just vanish off the face of the earth after walking away from the, the construction site, um, it puts you in the area of all kinds of thoughts of what could have happened to him. He could have been abducted. It could have just been one of those moments where he just vanished off the face of the earth. Um, it could be a pedophile. He could be um, sold in a sex room. It could be anything, you know, because you can't really rule out any of those uh, scenarios because it could have been one of the weird cases dealing with the 411, uh, the missing 411 cases. It could just be your typical uh, abduction or banishing where a, a young child is abducted by someone and they're never seen again because they probably 
you know, chop them up and spread it there. Uh, body parts all over the country. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I'm not saying that it does, but it's a possibility. Um, especially if they don't want them to be found and they don't want anything to lead back to them or lead back to the people that took him. So, um, so I can tell you right now, um, when I was in California visiting uh, family members when I was a young boy, uh, me and my older cousin was walking down the street on the main strip near where my um, my aunt lived, and this car rolled up beside us and said, "Y'all need a ride?" And we said, "No, we don't. We're good." And he turned around. He made a U-turn and went back in the opposite direction. Now there's a good chance that we could have been abducted at that point, you know, and we probably never would have been seen again. And for for some, and for a complete stranger to just come up to someone and say that you need a ride. You know, it, it got to be something wrong with that. Why would you come up to a bunch of strangers asking them, asking them if they need a ride? I mean, that just that's just... Now, if a taxi cab drove up next to us, that's one thing. But sometimes, I don't even think you can even trust a taxi cab driver because they could be somebody that just want to kidnap somebody. Or a uh, abductor may have knocked the cab, the cab driver out and, and stole the cab just so he can, you know, drive around and see if he can find some victims. Now, did that was was that guy a, a pedophile or a kidnapper? I don't know. I'm glad I never found out. But it was just the fact that he literally just rolled up on us and asked if we needed a ride. I'm like, but why? That makes you wonder why would you even do do something like that? I mean, if we're walking and we know and we may know where we're going. You don't know that. If, I mean, why worry about us needing a ride if you're trying to do something stupid? So. I'm just glad nothing came about that. So, like I said, when we told him no, he just turned around and went back in it. He made a big U-turn and went back in the opposite direction. So, I could have been one of those people that was kidnapped or abducted by someone, me and my cousin. So, but yeah, that, that case right there with that young boy um, is pretty um, weird because he just walked away and never returned. And the fact that a person can walk away without someone knowing and never come back, it makes you wonder what could have happened to him at that point where he walked away. And what could have happened to him for him not to come back? That is the biggest question of all in a lot of these cases. Uh, what happened to these people? Even the ones that disappear in national parks. You know they're going into a certain area and then when you least expect it, they just disappear. And when you realize they didn't come back at the t in a timely manner, or when they claimed they were going to come back, that's when you start saying, what could have happened? You know, I should have been there, and this and that and the other. But whatever's doing this, it's very clever. And it knows when to take someone, and it knows what to do in order for them to disappear. And they create these weird scenarios so that we can be, is can be confused to the point where we just would never be able to figure it out, you know. I mean, for them to wait until they're alone in an area where nobody can hear you scream, and then you just vanish off the face of the earth, you know. Like, let's take Stacy Aris, Stacy Ann Aris, for instance. She disappeared in um, a place called Sunrise. Uh, I think it's Sunrise Camps, something like that. Uh, they were talked about her a lot because it was, you know, uh, in his backyard. And, it, you know, it hit home with him when he found out about her. You know, she's, uh, you know, horseback riding with her father and a bunch of people that they went up there with. She goes into this little, she walks in down this little, uh, I think it was like a boulder field. And there was a lake at the, at the edge of that boulder field. And there was a lot of trees in the area that surrounded the lake. She goes do a little path near, you know, in between the trees, and she never came out. When they searched for her in that area where, they, where she was last seen, all they found was the lens cap to her camera. Now, in a situation like that, a person that disappears like that, and you only find one piece of evidence that can only state that she was there, but it doesn't say anything as far as how she disappeared, where she went, what happened to her footprints. You know, who took her? What took her? How did she disappear? Did she walk through a wormhole? Did they take her somewhere and kill her and bury her? 
Nobody knows. And Flint, and same thing with um, uh, what's her name, um, uh, Madison Scott. For her to be in the area that she was in, she vanished between the hours of um, I think like four and eight o'clock in the morning. That's uh, Saturday. Now, the thing that uh, I, um, I've been hearing about a lot when it came to David Paletta's, he would always talk about when they're using FLIR cameras on helicopters uh, and they're searching the grounds, they look for those heat signatures to see if there's, any, if there's a body lying on the ground. Now, if you can't find it, that means it, there's a good chance that that body may be underneath a log. And I know that sounds a little far-fetched, but they have found... Uh, the bodies of young children or young men or young women underneath a log. So somebody was clever enough to realize that if you place a body underneath a log, knowing that uh, 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 a log would show up as a cold surface in a flare camera, it would literally block the heat signature of the body itself. Uh, you know, the, the body of the person that was missing. So you'd never see it. So I would ask anybody that lives in uh, British Columbia, Vanderhoof, uh, to tell um, Madison Scott's parents, Dawn and Eldon, see if they can get someone to go in to a, uh, one of those areas where there's a lot of trees down, maybe a, one of them big old huge oak trees, or uh, maybe there's a log lying on the ground. Check underneath it to see if there's a body underneath there's a good chance that she may be under that. Who knows? You know, but it's worth a shot because I have heard about this through David Pilates where he talked about how they have been found underneath the log. Or, you know, especially if they're flying over with FLIR and they can't see it and all of a sudden, bam, they see maybe an arm sticking out and then, boom, there's the body. How they got under there, I don't know. It was like someone had enough strength to lift it up, put the body there, then place the log right on top of the body. Weird. But yet, it has been, it has happened. So, uh, yeah, that's what you need to do. So, anybody out there that knows anything, anybody out there that may have any information, or knows the family of the, uh, of the Scott family, tell them that, you know. Or I may even call into um, the RCMP hotline you know, and tell them that maybe I should look under uh, logs in the area where she was last seen. You know, maybe her body may be underneath the log because I have heard cases like that. You know, because they know they're gonna start asking questions and where'd you hear this from? Uh, David Pilates. And they may say, oh, okay, I've heard of him, but that doesn't mean that that's what happens. I'm just saying, you never know. I mean, I mean you gotta look at all options. You know, I'm pretty sure that may have been an option. I don't know. It may not have been, who knows? So. Yeah, but guys, that's my time on this video. I want to thank you guys for watching, and I will have more coming in the next couple of days. Uh, I got to do some more digging on some other stories that was given to me by one of my viewers. Uh, one of which he found out that the people that were missing, which was a mother and daughter uh, team, she was basically trying to get uh, away from her boyfriend or husband and she took the child, but they were found. So that's a good thing. They were alive, they were alive and well. Um, so uh, they got, I got a couple more stories that I, I, would, I was given to by some of my viewers. So I gotta look into those as well. Um, and I got a couple more stories that I wanna um, get, get in that I heard from David Politis. Um, one of uh, that little girl, a little girl named Katie Flynn that somehow vanished from where she was and was found on the other side of a lake, standing on top of a log. Uh, but I'll get into that story. I get into that story when I when I post it. So anyway, like once again, I want to thank you guys for watching, and I will see you guys later. Aloha, mahalo, and ahuiho. Peace out, guys.